stage, I just want to let you know right now, we've got over 50 people in our audience, which is just so cool. It's like nuts. I'm talking to you from my kitchen in Brooklyn. We've got performers in California. We've got performers in Maine, in Pennsylvania, in New Jersey, in New York. Um, I don't know if I'm missing any, but I'm sure we'll find out during intermission. Let's get going. If you need to take a break, if things get messed up, if things, if we've got glitches, thank you so much for your patience. Um, and uh, as uh, to paraphrase Puck at the end of Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, if these shadows do offend, we, we hope you'll forgive us. We hope you'll forgive us. And that the work here will mend that. Um, and without any further ado, let's begin with Antigone. Good heavens. How about some quotes? This is how we began this play a long time ago. Will later is doing our audio. Will, I'm gonna ask you to get yourself set up because I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna need you to join in a moment. Let's go. Well, here we are. These people that you see here via Zoom are about to act out for you the story of Antigone. The little creature you see sitting by herself, staring straight ahead, seeing nothing, is Antigone. She is thinking. She is thinking that the instant we finish telling you who's who and what's what in this play, she will burst forth as the dark, tense, serious girl who is about to rise up and face the whole world alone. Alone against the world and against Creon, her uncle, the king. Another thing she's thinking is this. She's going to die. Antigone is young. She would much rather live than die, but there is no help for it. When you are on the side of the gods against the tyrant of men, against the state of purity, against corruption, when, in short, your name, is Antigone, there's only one part you can play. And she will have to play hers through to the end. Mind you, Antigone doesn't know all these things about herself. Uh, we know them because it is our business to know them. That's what a Greek chorus is for. All that she knows is that Creon won't allow her dead brother to be buried. And that despite Creon, 
she must bury him. She thinks she acts. She doesn't reason. She feels. And from the moment her story started, she began to feel that inhuman forces were whirling her out of this world, snatching her away from her system. Oh, you see, smiling at that young man, making her an instrument of the gods in a way she cannot fathom, but that she will faithfully pursue. You have never seen inhumane forces at work. You will tonight. All of us who sit or stand here, not in the least upset ourselves, we will see immortal forces we rarely see in our own lives while looking at her, for we are not doomed to die tonight. The young man with Ismene, with the happy and beautiful Ismene, is Haman. He is the king's son, Creon's son, the apple of the king's eye. Antigone and he are engaged to be married. You wouldn't have thought he was his type. <laughs> he likes dancing, sports, competition, and he likes women too. Now, look at Ismene again. She is certainly more beautiful than Antigone. She is the girl you think he'd go for. Wow. There was that dance one night. Ismene wore a new evening frock. She was radiant. <clears throat> Haman danced every dance that night with her. And yet, that same night before the dance was over, he went in search of Antigone and found her sitting alone, like that, with her arms clasped around her knees and asked her to marry him. We still don't know how it happened. It didn't seem to surprise Antigone in the least. She looked up at him out of those solemn eyes of hers, smiled sort of sadly and said yes. And that was all. The band struck up another dance. Ismene, surrounded by a group of young men, laughed out loud. And well, here is Haman, expecting to marry Antigone. Oh, he won't, of course. He didn't know that. When he asked her that the earth wasn't meant to hold a husband for Antigone. And that... This precisely right to my sooner than he might have that otherwise That distinguished... Done powerfully built man sitting lost in thought with his little assistant at his side is Creon, the king. His face is lined. He is tired. He practices the difficult art of a leader of men. When he was younger, when Oedipus was king and Creon was no more than the king's brother-in-law, he was different. He loved music, bought rare manuscripts, was um, a kind of art patron. He would while away whole afternoons in the antique shops of this city of Thebes. But Oedipus died. Oedipus's sons died. Creon had to roll up his sleeves and take over the kingdom. Now and then, when he goes to bed, weary with the day's work, he wonders whether this business of being a leader of men is worth the trouble. But when he wakes up, problems are there to be solved. And like a conscientious workman, he does his job. Creon has a wife, a queen. Her name is Eurydice. There she sits, the loyal wife, with the knitting, next to the nurse who brought up the two girls. The nurse had the impossible task of raising the children of Oedipus. How difficult is an impossible task? Impossible. <laughs> the queen will go on knitting all through the, through the play until the time comes for her to go to her room and die. She is a good woman, a worthy, loving soul, but she is no help to her husband. Kieran has to face the music alone, alone with his assistant standing there, who is too young to be of any help. The others, uh, well, let's see. The pair of pale young women over there are the messengers. Later on, they will come running in to announce that Haman is dead. They both have a premonition of catastrophe. That's what they're brooding over. That's why they won't mingle with the others. As for those uh, strong, blank-faced card <laughs> players, they are the guards. One smells of garlic, another of beer, another counts days to retirement, but they're not a bad lot. They have wives they're afraid of, kids who are afraid of them, 
We are bothered by the little day-to-day -day worries that beset us all. At the same time, they are policemen, eternally indifferent for nothing that happens can matter to them. They are quite prepared to arrest anybody at all, including Creon himself, should the order be given by a new leader. And that's the lot. And now for the play. Oedipus, who was the father of the two girls, Antigone and Ismene, had also two sons, Eteocles and Polynices. After Oedipus died, it was agreed that the two sons should share his throne, each to reign over Thebes in alternate years. But when Eteocles, the elder son, had reigned a full year <laughs> and time had come for him to step down, <laughs> he refused to yield, to yield up the throne to his younger brother, Polynices. There was a civil war. Polynices brought up allies, six foreign. And in the course of the war, he and his foreigners were defeated. The two brothers fought, and they met and killed one another in single combat just outside the city walls. And now Creon is king. Uh, Creon, in response, has issued a solemn edict that uh, Eteocles, on whose side he was, is a hero to be buried with pomp and honors, and that the younger brother, Polynices, is a terrorist to be left to rot. The vultures and the dogs are to float themselves on his carcass. Nobody is to go into mourning for him. No gravestone is to be set up in his memory. And above all, any person who attempts to give him a religious burial will himself be put to death. It is against this that Antigone rebels. What is for Creon merely the climax of a political purge is for her a hideous offense against God and man. Thebes is in crisis. A king has to hold his city together. A sister has to honor her brother. An ancient story must be told. And that's the end of act one, scene one. Act one, scene two opens on a dim living room in the house of Oedipus. Imagine that there is a chair and a sofa. A clock strikes 6 a.m. Imagine that in your mind for a second. Antigone slinks into the room, sneaking in, holding her sandals, her feet a bit dirty. She makes it most of the way across the kitchen when the nurse speaks from the chair. She's in a robe, sitting in darkness, and has been up all night. Where have you been? Nowhere. It was beautiful. The whole world was gray when I went out, and now you wouldn't recognize it. It's like a postcard, all pink and green and yellow. You'll have to get up earlier, nurse, if you want to see a world without color. It was still pitch black when I got up. I went to a room where I thought you might have flung off your blanket in the middle of the night, and you weren't there. It was still pitch black when I got up. The garden was lovely. It was still asleep. Have you ever thought how lovely a garden is when it is not yet thinking of men? You hadn't slept in your bed. I couldn't find you. I went to the back door. You left it half open. The fields were wet. They were waiting for something to happen. The whole world was breathless waiting. I can't tell you what a roaring noise I seemed to make alone on the road. It bothered me that Whatever was waiting, wasn't waiting for me. I took off my sandals and I slipped into a field. You will do well to wash your feet before you go back to bed, miss. I'm not going back to bed. Don't be a fool. Get some sleep. And me, getting up to see if she hasn't flung off her blanket and I find her bed cold and nobody in it. Do you think that if I got up every morning like this, it would be just as thrilling every morning to be the first person out of doors? Morning, my grandmother. It was nice, and it still is. And now, my girl, you will stop trying to squirm out of this and tell me what you were up to. Where have you been? That's true. It was still night. There wasn't a soul out of doors but me who thought that it was morning. Don't you think it's, it's marvelous to be the first person who is aware that it is morning? Oh, my little rascal. Can't imagine what I'm talking about, Kenji. Go on with you, I know that game. Where have you been, wicked girl? No, not wicked. You went out to meet someone, didn't you? Deny it if you can. Yes, I went out to meet someone. Oh, a lover? 
Yes, nurse. Yes, the poor dear. I, I have a lover. Oh, that's very nice now, isn't it? Such a story. You, the daughter of a king running out to meet lovers. And we work our finger to the bone for you. We slaves to bring you up like young ladies, but you're all alike, all of you. Even you who never used to stop and primp in front of a mirror or smear your mouth with lipstick or stand around to make the boys ogle you and you ogle back. How many times I'd say to myself, now that one, I wish she was just a little bit more of a coquette, always wearing the same dress, her hair tumbling round her face. One thing for sure, I'd say to myself, none of the boys will look at her while is Benet's about all curled and cute and tidy and trim. I'll have this one on my hands for the rest of my life. And now you see, just like your sister, except worse, a hypocrite. Who is the lad? Some little punk, huh? Somebody you can't bring home and show to your family and say, well, here he is. I'm in love with him and his criminal lifestyle. That's how it is, isn't it? Answer me. <sighs> That's how it is. Yes, nurse. I took her when she wasn't that high. I promised her poor mother that I'd make a lady out of her. Now look at her. But don't you go thinking that this is the end of this, my youngin. I am only your nurse, and you can play deaf and dumb with me. I don't count. But your Uncle Creon will hear of this. That, I promise you. Yes, Creon will hear of this. And we'll hear what he has to say when he finds out that you go wandering around at night. Not to mention Haman. For the girls in tears. Going to be married. Going to be married. And she hops out of bed at four in the morning to meet somebody else in a field. You know what I ought to do with you. I ought to take you over my knee the way I used to do when you were a little girl. Please, nurse, I want to be alone. And if she so much as speaks of it, she wants to be alone. Nanny, don't yell at me. This isn't a day when you should be losing your temper. Yes, indeed. Along with the rest of it, I'm to like it. Didn't I promise your mother? Oh, what would she say if she was here? Old stupid. That's what she'd call me. Old stupid not to know how to make my little girls pure. Spend your life making them behave, watching over them like, like a mother's hen and running after them with scarves and sweaters to keep them warm and dinner every night to keep them warm. And then at four o'clock in the morning, you who always complain you can never sleep a wink is snoring in your bed and letting them slip out into the bushes. That's what you say to me, your mother. And I would stand there dying of shame if I wasn't dead already and all I could do would not dare look at her in the face and say, that's true, I say, that's all true what you say, your majesty. I am old, and I am stupid. Nanny, oh, Nanny, don't cry. You'll be able to look Mama in the face when it's your time to see her. She knows why I went out this morning. I'm pure, and I swear that I have no one other than Haman. If you like, I'll swear that I shall never be with anyone other than Haman. Save your tears, Nanny. You may still need them. When you cry like that, I, I become a little girl again. And I mustn't be a little girl today. Antigone, what are you doing up at this hour? I have just been to your room. Oh, the two of you now. You're both going mad to be up before I've even started my tea. Do you like running around without a mouthful of breakfast? Do you think that it is decent for daughters of a king? <sighs> and look at you, with nothing on and the sun's not up. I'll have you both on my hands with a cold before I know it. Nanny dear, go away now. It's not chilly, really. Summer's here. Go and make us some tea. Yes, Nanny, I'd love some tea. It would do me so much good. Oh, my poor baby. Her head swimming with nothing on her stomach and me standing here like an idiot when I could be getting her something hot to drink. Aren't you well? Yes. Of course, just a little tired, because I got up too early. Yeah, I couldn't sleep either. Ismene, you ought not to go without your beauty sleep. Don't make fun of me. I'm not, truly. This particular morning, seeing how beautiful you are makes everything easier for me. Oh, wasn't I a miserable little beast when we were small? I used to fling mud at you and put worms down your neck. 
I can remember tying you to a tree and cutting off your hair, your beautiful hair. How easy it must be never to be unreasonable with all that smooth silken hair so beautifully set around your head. Why do you insist upon talking about other things? I am not talking about other things. Antigone, I've thought about it a lot. Did you? I thought about it all night long. Antigone, you're mad. Am I? We cannot do it. Why not? Because Creon will have us put to death. Of course he will. But we are bound to go out and bury our brother. That's the way it is. What do you think we can do to change it? I don't want to die. I'd prefer not to die myself. Okay, listen to me, Antigone. I've thought about it all night long. I may be younger than you are, but I always think things over and you don't. Sometimes it is better not to think too much. I don't agree with you. I... Antigone, I know it's horrible. I know that Polynices was cheated out of his rights, that he made war, that Creon sized against him and he was killed. And I pity Polynices just as much as you do. But all the same, I sort of see what Uncle Creon means. <sighs> Uncle Creon is the king now. He has to set an example. Example? Creon orders that our brother rot and putrefy and be mangled by dogs and birds of prey. That's an offense against every decent human instinct, against the laws of God and man, and you talk about <laughs> examples? Okay, there you go, off on your own again, refusing to pay the slightest heed to anybody else. At least you might try to understand. I only understand that a man lies rotting, unburied, and that he is my brother, our brother. But Creon won't let us bury him. And he is stronger than we are. He is the king. He has made himself the king. I am not listening to you. You must! You know how Creon works, Antigone! His mob will come running, howling as it runs. A thousand arms will seize our arms, a thousand breaths will breathe into our faces, and like one single pair of eyes, a thousand eyes will stare at us. We'll be, we'll be driven in turmoil through their hatred, through the smell of them and their cruel, roaring laughter. We'll be dragged through the press. Yeah, mugshots in every single magazine surrounded by guards with their idiot faces all bloated and their beefy eyes staring at us. And we'll know that no shrieking and no begging will make them understand that we want to live. For they're like trained beasts that just go through the motions. And we shall suffer. We shall feel pain rising in us until it becomes so unbearable that we know it must stop, but it won't stop, Antigone. It will just keep on rising and rising like a screaming voice. I can't, I can't do it, Antigone. How well you have thought it all out. I thought about it all night long, didn't you? Yes. I'm an awful coward, Antigone. So am I. But what has that to do with it? Don't you want to go on living? Go on living? Who was always the first out of bed every morning because she loved the touch of the cold morning air on her bare skin? Or the last to bed because nothing less than infinite weariness could wean her from the lingering night? You, Antigone, my darling sister. No, for God's sakes, don't. You say you've thought it all out. The howling mob, the torture, the fear of death. They've made up your mind for you. Is that it? Yeah. All right. They're as good as any. Antigone, be reasonable, please. It's all very well for, for men to believe in ideas and for them to die for them, but you are a girl. Antigone, you have everything in the world to make you happy. Everything. All you have to do is just reach out for it. You're, you're going to be married. You're young. You're, you're beautiful. I am not beautiful. Yes, you are. I mean, not the way that other girls are, but it's always you that the little tough boys turn to look back at when they pass us in the street. And when you go by, the little girls, they stop and they stare and they stare at you until we've turned the corner. Little boys and little girls. And what about Haman? I shall see Haman this morning. I'll take care of Haman. Go back to bed now, Ismene. The sun is coming up, and as you can see, there is nothing I can do today. Our brother Polynices is as well guarded as if he had won the war and were sitting on his throne. What are you gonna do? Breakfast time, my dears! It's your favorite oatmeal! Please go back to bed. If I do, promise me you won't leave this house. Very well then, I promise. 
Come along, breakfast, my dears. I'm not very hungry, nurse. My darling, where's your pain? <sighs> Nowhere, but you must keep me warm and safe as you used to do when I was little. Oh, Nanny, give me your hand as if I were sick in bed and you were sitting beside me. My lamb, what is it? What is beating your heart out? Nothing. It's just that I'm not quite strong enough for what I have to do. But nobody but you must know that. Not strong enough for what, my kitten? Nothing. It's so good that you are here. I can hold your calloused hand to ward off evil. You are very powerful, Nanny. What is it you want me to do for you, my baby? There isn't anything to do except put your hand like this against my cheek. I'm not afraid anymore. Yes. Nanny. Yes? Get your dog puff. Yeah, my dog, Puff. Well? Promise me that you won't ever scold her again. Dogs are dirty up the house, but their filthy paws deserve to be scolded. And promise me that you will talk to her, and that you will talk to her often. <laughs> me? <laughs> talk to a dog? But you aren't to talk to her the way that people usually talk to dogs. You're to talk to her the way that I talk to her. I don't see why. If both of us are here, we should make fools out of ourselves. So as long as you're here, one ought to be enough. But if there was some reason why I couldn't go on talking to her... Couldn't go on talking to her? And why couldn't you go on talking to her? Now what kind of poppycock is this? I would like to know. <sighs> and if she got too unhappy if she moaned and moaned waiting for me with her nose under the door the way she does when I'm out all day, then the best thing, Nanny, might be to have her mercifully put to sleep. Now what has gotten into you this morning? Running around in the darkness, won't sleep, won't eat, and now it's your dog she wants killed. I never- Nanny, I'll, I'll eat. I, I want to eat. It's my favorite, oatmeal and, and my tea. You always think of everything. Let's just sit and relax. The nurse grabs the remote and turns on the television. The sound of a news report fills the space. And they watch pieces of crime, terrorism, and protests from all over the world. Important family planning services that we The nurse hears something, gets up and leaves to go and get someone who's at the door. Antigone reaches down, turns off the television, and Haman has entered, brought in by the nurse. Haman. Forgive me for quarreling with you last night. Forgive me for everything. It was all my fault. I beg you to forget, forgive me. You know that I've forgiven you. You would hardly slam the door. Your perfume still hung in the room and I had already forgiven you. You stole that perfume. From whom? Ismene. And the lipstick? And the face powder? And the scarf? Ismene. And in whose honor did you get yourself up so glamorously? I'll tell you. Oh, what a fool I was to waste a whole evening. A whole beautiful evening. We'll have other evenings, my sweet. Perhaps we won't. And other quarrels, too. A, a happy love is full of quarrels. A happy love, yes. Haman, listen to me. Yes? A and don't laugh at me this morning. Be serious. I am serious. A and hold me tight. Tighter than you have ever held me. I need all of your strength to flow into me. There, with, with all my strength. <sighs> That's good. Haman, I, I wanted to tell you, you know the little boy we were going to have when we were married? Yes. I'd have protected him against everything in the world. Yes, I know. No, oh, you don't know how I should have held him in my arms and given him my strength. He wouldn't have been afraid of anything, Haman. His mother wouldn't have been very imposing. 
Her hair wouldn't have been very well brushed, but she would have been so strong where he was concerned. So much stronger than any other mother in the world. You believe that, don't you, Heyman? Yes, of course. And you believe me when I say that you would have had a real wife? I have a real wife. Heyman, you loved me. You did love me that night. You're sure of it? What night? And are you sure that that night at the dance, when you came to the corner where I was sitting, there was no mistake? It was me you were looking for? It wasn't another girl? And that not in your secret heart of hearts have you said to yourself that it was Ismene you ought to have asked to marry you? Antigone, you are idiotic. Oh, you do love me, don't you? Your arms around me aren't lying, aren't they? Your hands so warm against my back, they aren't lies. This warmth, this strength that flows through me as I stand so close to you, they aren't lies, are they? Antigone, I love you. I'm sallow and I'm not pretty. Ismene is pink and golden. She's like a fruit. Antigone! Oh, forgive me, I, I'm ashamed of myself. But this morning, this special morning, I must know, tell me the truth. When you think of me, when it strikes you suddenly that I am going to belong to you, do you get the sense that, that a great empty space is being hollowed out inside you and that there is something inside you that is, is just dying? Yes, I do. That's the way I feel. And now I have two things I have to tell you. And when I have told them to you, you must go away instantly without asking any questions. However strange they may seem to you, however much they may hurt you, swear that you will. What are, you, what are these things that you are going to tell me? Swear first that you will go away without a single word, without so much as looking at me. You hear me, Heyman, swear, please. It's the last crazy wish that you will ever have to grant me. I swear it. Thank you. Well, here it is. First, about last night when I went to your house, you asked me a moment ago why I wore Ismene's scarf and makeup. I did it because I was stupid. I wasn't sure that you loved me as a woman, and I did it because I wanted you to want me. Was that the reason? Oh, my poor- you No, wait. That was the reason, and you laughed at me, and we fought, and I flung out of the house. The reason why I went to your house last night is that I wanted you, I wanted you to take me. I wanted to be your wife before. Antigone? Heyman, you swore you wouldn't ask a single question. You swore it. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you why. I wanted to be your wife last night because I love you. And also because I'm going to cause you such a lot of pain. And I wanted it also because I shall never, never be able to marry you. Never. Antigone. Hey, Min, you took a solemn oath. You swore. Leave me now. Tomorrow, the whole thing will be clear to you. Even before tomorrow, this, this afternoon. Go now. It's the only thing left that you can do for me, if you still love me. Well, it's over for Haman, Antigone. What were you talking about? Nothing to be concerned about. What is wrong? Antigone, I, I, I can't sleep. I'm terrified. I'm so afraid that even though it's daylight, you're gonna still try to bury Polynices. Antigone, you know I love you. You know I want you to be happy. And you remember what he was like. I mean, he was our brother, of course, but, but he never loved us. And he's dead, and he was a bad brother. He was like an enemy in this house. He never thought of you. Why should you think of him? So what if he does lie rotting in a field? It's Creon's doing, not ours. Don't try to change things. You can't bury Polynices. I won't let you. You are too late, Ismene. When you first saw me this morning, I had just come in from burying him. End of Act 1, Scene 6. And we enter into Act 1, Scene 7. Picture Creon's police headquarters and command center. Lights up on Eurydice and Creon. She fixes his tie as an assistant helps Creon with his jacket. They have a moment. Then Creon enters the workspace, which emerges around him. 
Eurydice exits, desks with computers, filing cabinets, find their places, covered with papers, folders, coffee mugs, etc. A worker greets Creon at his desk with a cup of coffee, another with an iPad that Creon looks over carelessly. He looks at it closely and then taps a few things and hands it back to an assistant. There is a hum of action in the office. The following chorus monologue occurs under this action. Is there anything more wonderful on Earth, our marvelous planet, than the miracle of man? With what arrogant ease he rides the dangerous seas, the Earth Mother herself before time began, the oldest of the ageless gods learned to endure his driving plow, turning the Earth till by the sweat of his brow, she yielded up her fruitlessness. The quick-witted birds are no match for him. Neither victim nor predator among the beast of the plain. His cunning surpasses their instinct. His skill is the greater. His snares never team, and his nets team. He has mastered the mysteries of language and thought, which moves faster than wind he has tamed and made rational. Political wisdom, too. All the practical arts of government he has studied and refined, built cities to shelter his head against rain and danger, and cold and ordered all things in his mind. There's no problem he cannot resolve by the exercise of his brains or his breath, and the only disease he cannot salve or cure is death. In action, he is subtle beyond imagination, limitless in his skill, and these gifts are both enemies and friends as he applies them with equal determination to good or evil ends. All men honor, and the state uplifts that man to the heights of glory, whose powers uphold the constitution and the gods and their laws. But if he shifts his ground and takes the wrong path. Despising morality. Blowing up with pride. Indulges himself and his power. In my home, may he never warm himself. Or sit at my side. Act one, scene eight. The first guard enters and speaks to a page who motions for him to wait. The page speaks to Creon. Rather, the guards, you say? One of those standing over the body. <clears throat> Show him in. Private Jonas, sir. Second battalion. Your report. Well, it's like this, chief. As soon as it happens, we says, gotta tell chief about this before anyone else spills it. He'll want to know right away. So we tosses a coin to see which one will come up and tell you about it. You see, Chief, we thought only one man better come up because after all, you don't want to leave the body without a guard, right? I mean, there's three of us on duty guarding the body. Speak in the plainest way and then we can have done with you. Chief, Chief, I've been 17 years in the service. Volunteer, two citations. My record's clean. I know my business and I know my place. I carry out orders, sir. Ask any officer in the battalion, they'll tell you. Leave it to Jonas. Give him an order and he'll carry it out. That's what they'll tell you. Jonas, that's me. Th that's my name. Talk sense, man. Why are you frightened? By rights, it's a corporal's job, Chief. I've been recommended for a corporal, but they haven't put it through yet. June, it was supposed to go through. But with all this red tape and the white... Is there any need out, for all this preamble? The page enters with a note for Creon. The other guards enter and stand at attention. If anything has gone wrong with that body, I will break all three of you. Nobody could say we didn't keep our eye on that body. We had the two o'clock watch, the tough one. You know how it is, Chief? It's nearly the end of the night. Your eyes are like lead. You got a crick in the back of your neck. There's shadows and the fog is beginning to roll in. The fine watch they give us. And me? 17 years in the service, but we were doing our duty all right, on our feet, all of us. Anyone says we were sleeping is a liar. First place, it was too cold. Second place, it oh was Oh my just... God. <sighs> yes, Chief, well, I turned around and looked at the body. We wasn't only 10 feet from it, but that's just how I am. I was keeping an eye on it. Listen, Chief, I was the first man to see it, me. They'll tell you, I was the first one to yell at that yell. What for, what was the matter? Uh, Chief, the body. Somebody had been there and buried him. Are you out of your mind? Do you know what you were saying? Who has dared disobey my orders? It wasn't much, you understand. With us three there, it couldn't have been. Just covered over with a little dirt, that's all, but enough to hide it from the buzzards. You are sure that it couldn't have been a dog scratching up the earth? 
not a chance, chief. That's kind of what we hoped it was, but the earth was scattered all over the body just the way the priest told you should do it. Whoever did that job knew what they was doing all right. I'm not interested in your opinions. Who could have dared? Was there any indication as to who might have done it? Not a thing, chief. Maybe we heard a footstep. I can't swear to it. Of course, we started right to the search, and the corporal found a shovel. A kid's shovel, no bigger than that. All rusty and everything. Corporal's got the shovel for you. We thought maybe a kid did it. A kid? No. A kid didn't do this on his own. Polynices friends with their accountants blocked by my orders in the bank of Thebes. Money, the virus that infects mankind with every sickness. These gangs and their warlords using a kid. I can imagine what he is like, their kid. A baby-faced killer creeping in the night with a toy shovel under his jacket. Very useful to them, an innocent child. A martyr, a baby face of 14, who will spit with contempt at the guards who kill him. A free gift to their cause. The precious, innocent blood of a child on my hands. They must have accomplices in the guard itself. Look here, you. Who else knows about this? Only us three, Chief. Ah, have you been selling your eyes for money? Looking the other way for cash? I think it's a shame, sir, that an intelligent man as educated as you are should should miss the point so completely. You! Come here. Why should you speak? I'm not interested in your opinions. Listen now. You will continue on duty. When the relief squad comes up, you will tell them to return to barracks. You will uncover the body, keep a sharp watch. And if another attempt is made to give the corpse burial, you will make an arrest and bring the culprit straight to me. And you will keep your mouth shut about this. Not one word to a human soul. You are all guilty of neglect of duty, and you will be punished. But if the rumor spreads through feeds that the body received burial, nothing shall save you from my wrath. All three of you. Chief, we never told nobody. I swear we didn't. Anyhow, we've been up here. Suppose some other guys spilled into the room. That, that wouldn't be our fault if someone talked to you. I've got two kids. You're my witness, Chief. If it couldn't have been me, I was here with you. If anyone talked to anyone, it couldn't have been me or any of this. I was here with you too, Chief. We were all here with you. Yeah. Do you dare answer me back? Me, sir? No, sir. I might be giving you an earache. I can see that. I talk too much. Always have them. The other pain is the heartburn, so to speak. That's the criminal that's causing that, not me or us. We're just giving you the earache, which is irritating. Get this into your heads. If you fail to find this enemy of the state and bring him here to me, you'll learn that death is the least of your punishments. Ooh, and now the spring is wound up tight. It will uncoil of itself. That is what is so convenient in tragedy. The least little turn of the wrist We'll do the job. Anything will set it going. A glance at a girl who happens to be lifting her arm to her hair as you go by. I'm not feeling when you wake up on a fine morning that you'd like a little respect to you paid today. As if it were as easy to order as a second cup of coffee. One question too many, idly thrown out over a friendly drink, and the tragedy is on. And the rest is automatic. You don't need to lift a finger. The machine is in perfect order. It has been oiled ever since time began, and it runs without friction. Death, treason, and sorrow are on the march. They move in the wake of the storm of tears of stillness, every kind of stillness. The hush, when the executioner's ax goes up at the end of the last act. The unbreathable silence when, at the beginning of the play, the two lovers, their hearts bared, their bodies naked, stand for the first time, face to face in the darkened room, afraid to stir. The silence inside you, when the roaring crowd acclaims the winner so that you think of it as a film without a soundtrack, mouths agape and no sound coming out of them, and you, the victor, already vanquished alone in the desert of your silence. Tragedy 
is clean. It is firm. It is flawless. It has nothing to do with melodrama, with wicked villains, persecuted maidens, avengers, gleams of hope, and 11th hour repentances. Death in a melodrama is really horrible because it's never inevitable. The dear old father might so easily have been saved. The honest young man might so easily have brought in the police five minutes earlier. In a tragedy, nothing is in doubt and everyone's destiny is known. That makes for tranquility. Tragedy is restful. And the reason is that hope, that foul, deceitful thing, has no part in it. There isn't any hope. You're trapped. The whole sky has fallen on you. And all you can do about it is shout. Now don't mistake me. We said shout. We did not say groan, whimper, or complain. That you cannot do. But you can shout aloud. You can get all those things that you never thought you'd be able to say or never even knew you had it in you to say. And you don't say these things because it will do any good to say them. You know better than that. You say them for their own sake. You say them because you learn from them. In melodrama, you argue and struggle in the hope of escape. That is vulgar. It's practical. But in tragedy, where there is no temptation to try to escape, argument is gratuitous. It's kingly. <coughs> Guard and Antigone in cuffs enter. The play is on. Antigone has been caught. And for the first time in her life, Antigone is going to be able to be herself. Come on now, miss. Give it a rest. The chief will be back here in a minute, and you can tell him all about it. All I know is my orders. I don't want to know what you were doing there. People always have excuses. We can't afford to listen to all the people who want to tell us what's the matter with this country. We'd never get our work done. They are hurting me. Tell them to take their dirty hands off me. Dirty hands, eh? And what about stiffs and dirt? You weren't afraid to touch them, were you? <laughs> They're dirty hands. Take a look at your own dirty hands. Tell them to let me go. I won't run away. My father was King Oedipus. I am Antigone. Oedipus's little girl. <laughs> How do you like that? Listen, miss. The Night Watch never picks up a lady, but they say, you better be careful. I'm sleeping with the police commissioner. <laughs> Guess you must have lost your shovel, didn't you? Had to go at it with your fingernails the second time. I guess. My God, I never saw such nerve. I turned back for about five seconds, and there she is, clawing away like a hyena. And oh boy, did she scratch and kick when I grabbed her straight from my eyes with the nails she went, and yelling something fierce about, I ain't finished yet, let me finish. <laughs> you keep hold of her. I'll make sure that she keeps her face shut. Don't worry. She's done squirming now. Listen, boys, we're going to get a bonus out of this. What do you say we throw a party, the three of us? At the horse? Behind Market Street? Works for me. Sunday would be a good day. we we'll off-duty Sunday. What do you say we bring the wives? Hell no. Let's have some fun tonight. Bring your wife, and they always put the damp on. Say, listen, who would have thought an hour ago that the three of us would be talking about having a party right now? The way I felt when the old man was interrogating me, we'd be lucky if we got docked off a month's pay. <laughs> I want to tell you, I was scared. You sure we're going to get a bonus? Yeah, something tells me this is big stuff. Oh, uh, well, what's his name, you know, in the 3rd Battalion? He got an extra month's pay for catching that guy with the bombing issue at the State House. If we get an extra month's pay, I vote we throw a party at the Arabians. You're crazy. He charges twice as much for liquor as anyone else in town. Unless you want to go upstairs, of course. Can't do that at the old woman's. Say, we ain't gonna do so hard, no matter how you figure it. You get an extra month's pay, and what happens? Everybody in the outfit knows it, and your wife knows it too. They might even line up the battalion and give it to you in front of everybody. Well, we'll see about that. If they do the job out in the barracks yard, of course that means women, kids, Everything. I should like to sit down, if you please. 
Oh, let her sit down. But keep hold of her. Antigone, what is this? Take off those handcuffs. What is this? It's the watch, Chief. We all came this time. But I gave orders that the relief was to go back to the barracks and stay there. I, I, told, I told you not to open your mouths about this. Nobody said a thing, Chief, but acting on your orders, we made the arrest and brought the body in. Where did these men find you? Right by the body. What were you doing near your brother's body? You knew what my orders were. What was she doing? Chief, that's why we brought her in. She was digging up the dirt with her nails. She was trying to cover the body up over again. Do you realize what you were saying? Do you understand what the punishment is for breaking this law? Look at me. Do you know what has to happen if this is true? Do you know what I have to do? Do you? You have to kill me. And that takes us to intermission. Um, we're going to take 10 minutes. It's 9.30 on the nose here in the East Coast coming at you from New York. Um, we're going to start back up at 9.40. Take a break. Do your thing. We're going to rock some music for you. And we will see you at 9.40. Hope you're enjoying the show. This is going so well. Thanks so much for joining us here in Antigone. 2020. you expected me to make you my art and make you a star and get you connected i'll meet you in the park i'll be calm and collected but we knew right from the start that you fall apart because i'm too expensive you talk about something that shouldn't be said out loud honestly i thought that i would be dead by now but security keeping my head held down Looked at me to be the eyes. 
eyes of age as he spoke right out talked of life talked of life he laughed slapped his leg and stared shows and county fairs throughout the south he spoke with the tears of 15 years how his dog can hear travels about dog up and die just up and die After 20 years, he still agreed. Mr. Bojangles, Mr. Bo Mr. Bo He said, I dance now at every chance and honky tonks for drinks and tears. But most of the time I spend behind these county bars. He said, I drink some beer. He shook his head. As he shook his head, I heard someone respectfully ask me, Mr. Bojangles, Mr. Bojangles, Mr. Bojangles. Before 
Okay, fam, it's time to get this party started. As we fade out on Lauren Hill. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to Antigone 2020, a live show for a live audience. Um, sending love to all of you around the world who are joining us. We've got people here across North America. We've got some people in Europe listening to us and watching us. And we've got some people in Southeast Asia who are tuning in. It's a delight to have you all. This is a global event, and it's just so cool to see you all. Um, Will, our beautiful uh, audio engineer, why don't you walk us through the next few slides, and let's begin with Act 2. Cheap. We, we pick up the action right where we left off. Chief, ask these men here. After I reported to you, I went back. And the first thing we did, we uncovered the body. The sun was beginning to come up. And it was starting to smell. So we moved them up on a little rise to get them in the wind. Of course, you wouldn't expect any trouble in broad daylight, but just the same, we decided one of us better keep his eye peeled all the time. So about noon, what with the sun and the smell, being the wind drop, <laughs> I wasn't feeling none too good. I went over to Matheson to get a two. I just had time to say thanks and stick in my mouth. When I turn around, there she is clawing away at the dirt with both hands, right out in broad daylight. Wouldn't you think when she saw me come running, she quit and beat it out of there? 
not her. She went right on digging as fast as she could, as if I wasn't there at all. And when I grabbed her, she scratched and bit and yelled to leave her alone. You see, she hadn't finished yet. The body wasn't covered up yet, and the like of that. This is true. We scraped the dirt off as fast as we could, then we sent for the relief, then we posted them. But we didn't tell them a thing, Chief. And we brought in the party so you could see her, and that's the truth, so help me God. Looks like we're having some technical difficulty for Creon, so I'm going to keep this rolling. So you're going to hear my voice until the amazing actor Kevin J. McCann returns to us. And was it you who covered the body the first time in the night? Yes, it was. With a toy shovel we used to take to the, tea, to the seashore when we were children. It was Polynesis' own shovel. He had cut his name in the handle. That was why I had left it with him. But these men took it away. So the next time, I had to do it with my hands. Chief, she was clawing away like a wild animal. Matter of fact, first minute we saw her, with the heat haze and everything, my pal says, that's gotta be a dog. A dog, he says. That's a girl, that is, I says, and it was. Very well. Show these men to the anteroom. You three men will wait outside. You are cleared of all charges, but I will expect a report from you later. Do we put the cuffs back on her, Chief? No. Act two, scene two, Creon dismisses the guards who exit. Were you followed here? Did anyone see you uh, coming or going? No. Have you told anybody about that you meant to, that you meant to do this? No. You're quite sure of that. Quite sure. This had better be true. We are all at your disposal, Lord Kriya. Uh, no reports. Only ceremonies of Thanksgiving for the end of the fighting. A night of celebration and dancing, followed by relaxation as the enemy retreats. Quiet covers the streets of Thebes. Very well. Now listen to me. You'll go straight to your room. When you get there, you will go to bed. You will say that you are not well and that you have not been out since yesterday. Your nurse will tell the same story, and I'll take care of those officers. Uncle Creon, you don't need to take care of those officers. I don't even want to know what that means. Anyway, there's no point. You must know that I'll do it all over again tonight. Why did you try to bury your brother? How could I not? You dared disobey the law? Yes, I did. Polynices was a terrorist and a traitor, and you know it. He was my brother. You heard my edict. It was proclaimed throughout the It was posted up on the city wall. Yes. You knew the punishment I decreed for any person who attempted to give him burial. Yes, I knew. We all know. Did you buy any chance act on the assumption that a daughter of Oedipus was above the law? No. I never doubted for an instant that you would have put me to death. I broke the law because it is your law, not the law of God. Natural justice, which is of all times and places, is a quality of Zeus, not kings. It recognizes no such law. You are just a man, mortal, just like me. And laws that you enact cannot overturn ancient moralities or common decency. They are eternal, are not written down, and never change. They are for today, yesterday, and all time. No one understands where they came from, but everyone recognizes their force. And no man's arrogance can make me disobey them. Those who are not buried wander eternally and find no rest. Everybody knows that. I owed it to him to unlock the house of the dead in which my father and my mother are waiting to welcome him. Polynices has earned his rest. Uh, this is her father speaking. <clears throat> Stubborn like him, she won't give way. Not even with the whole of the state against her. She doesn't have the sense to back off when she gets into this kind of trouble. Well, we shall see. Any man can be broken and often the most committed and determined breaks soonest. Pride of Oedipus. Oedipus and his headstrong pride. All over again. I can see your father in you. And I believe you. 
Of course you thought that I should have you killed. Proud as you are, it seemed a natural climax to your existence. Your father was like that. For him, as for you, human happiness was meaningless. And mere human misery was not enough to satisfy his passion for torment. No, no, no. Uh, only a cozy tea party with death and destiny itself will quench your thirst. How avidly men and women drink the brew of such a tale when their names are Oedipus and Antigone. And it is so simple afterwards to do what your father did to put out his eyes and take you, his daughter, begging on the highways. Let me tell you this, Antigone, those days are over for Thebes. Thebes has a right to a king without a past. My name, thank God, is only Creon. I stand here with uh, both firm feet on the ground, with both hands in my pockets, and I decided that so long as I, the king, being less ambitious than your father was, I shall merely devote myself to introducing a little order into this absurd little kingdom, if that is possible. It is my job, and like every other trade, it isn't all beer and Skittles. Kings, my girl, have other things to do than to surrender themselves to their private feelings. She glories in the crime she has committed and insults me to my face. If she is allowed to flout the law in this way, all authority in the state will collapse. She is my niece my sister's child, but I am the law. And that responsibility is above kinship. Were she even closer, the closest, my own daughter, my duty would be plain. I know that you think I am a monster, and I'm sure that you must consider me very short-sighted, but the fact is, I have always been fond of you. Stubborn though you always were, don't forget that the first stall you ever had came from me. Oh, where could you possibly think you're going? I must go out and bury my brother. Those men have uncovered him. You must want very much to die. You know so little about how the world works. Stop feeling sorry for me. Do as I do. Do your job. But if you are a human being, do it quickly. I want to save you, Antigone. You are the king, and you are all powerful, but you can neither save me nor stop me. I need the room. And send for the other one, her sister, her accomplice, no doubt, in this illegal act. Bring her here. The conspiracies end now. I shall save you yet. God knows I have things enough to do today without wasting my time on an insect like you, but urgent things can wait. I'm not going to let politics be the cause of your death, but it is a fact that this whole business is nothing but politics. The mournful soul of Polynices, the decomposing corpse, the sentimental weeping, and the hysteria that you mistake for heroism. Politics. Nothing but politics. Look, I'm very orderly. I like things clean, well scrubbed. Don't think that I am not just as offended as you are by the thought of that meat rotting in the sun in the evening when the breeze comes in off the sea you can smell it in the palace and it nauseates me but i refuse to even shut my windows it is awful and i can tell you that i what i won't tell anyone else it's stupid it's monstrously stupid but the People of Thebes have got to see what is actually happening here. My God, if it was up to me, I should have had your brother buried long ago as a mere matter of public hygiene. But if the clueless, careless masses that govern are to understand what's what, that stench has got to fill the town for a month. You are a disgusting person. I agree. My trade forces me to be. We could argue whether I ought not to follow my trade, but once I take on the job, I must do it properly. Why do you do it at all? I woke up one morning and found myself king of thieves. God knows there were other things I loved in life more than power. Then you should have said no. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I could have said no. Only I felt that it would have been cowardly. It was a job that needed to be done, so I said yes. So much the worse for you then. I didn't say yes. I can say no to anything that I think is awful, and I don't have to count the cost. But because you said yes 
to your lust for power. All that you can do for your crown, your city, all that you can do is have me killed. Listen to me. There is nothing you can tell me that I don't know. But there are a thousand things I can tell you that you don't know. I don't have to do things that I think are wrong. If it comes to that, you didn't really want to leave my brother's body unburied, did you? Say it. Admit that you didn't. I've said it already. But you did it anyway. And now, though you don't want to, you're going to have me executed. And you call that being king. Yeah, I call that being king. And poor Creon. My nails are broken. My fingers are bleeding. My arms are covered with the once left by the paws of your guards. But I am a queen. And why not take pity on me and live? Isn't your brother's corpse payment enough for peace and order in Thebes? No. You said yes, and you made yourself the man in charge, and now you will never stop paying. But God in heaven, won't you try to understand me? I'm trying hard enough to understand you. There had to be one man who said yes. Somebody had to agree to captain the ship. Somebody had to to grab the wheel. She'd sprung a hundred leaks. Everybody on board was about to drown. And only because the only thing they thought of was their own skins and their cheap little day-to-day traffic. The people of Thebes do not crave justice. The mob does not long for fairness. It merely chooses someone to blame when something goes wrong. The mob is a beast to... (laughs) A beast as nameless as the wave that crashes down upon your deck. Nameless as the whipping wind and you, raced at the wheel. You have no name either. Nothing has a name except the ship and a storm. Now do you understand? I am not here to understand these things. I am here because I said no to you. It is easy to say no. Not always. Oh, it is. No is one of your man-made words. To say yes, you have to sweat and roll up your sleeves and plunge both hands into life up to the elbows. Can you imagine a world in which trees say no to sap? In which beasts say no to hunger or to raising their young? In which animals say no to survival itself? Animals? Oh, what a king you could make, Creon, if only men were animals. I said no. I've buried my brother. I aspire to no greater honor. And if I am to be famous, let it be for that. All these, these staff members and guards and citizens, they all agree with me in their hearts. But there is no gag like fear, is there? No persuasion like power? Tyrants must have their way in word, in action. You are quite mistaken. None of the Thebans anywhere in the city think as you do. They all do, but they keep their mouths shut around you. Not at all, and you should be ashamed of yourself, putting yourself against the majority. This monster came to burn our homes, our temples, our city, to destroy our way of life. I love my brother. I honor him dead, as I loved him living. There's no shame in that. And the one murdered? Wasn't he also your brother? My mother bore them both, and I loved them both. Yes, and one died defending his country, while the other one attacked it. The dead have their rights, and we have our duties towards them, dictated by common decency. And if good and bad are to be honored equally, where are our values? Patriotism, our civic duty. My way is to share my love, not share my hate. Oh, share your love. By all means, share it with the dead. Women must learn to obey, as well as men. They can have no special treatment. Law is law, and will remain so while I am alive. Antigone. You too. What do you want? Oh, forgive me, Antigone. Don't hate me. I've come back. I'll go with you now. Where will you go with me? Creon, if you kill her, you're going to have to kill me, too. I was with her. I helped her bury Polynices. Oh, no, Ismene. You had your chance to come with me in the Black Knight, creeping on your hands and knees. You had your chance to claw up the earth with your nails and get yourself caught like a thief, as I did, and you refused it. Not anymore. If you die, I don't want to live. I'll do it alone tonight. The dead man knows who buried him. What use are people who are now all words and no action? Please, Antigone, don't despise me. Let me have the honor and die with you, please. You've no right to claim the honor for doing what you were afraid to do. One death will be enough. Why should you die? Because life without you won't be worth living. Ask Creon to protect you. He's your uncle. For God's sake, Antigone, will you not even allow me to share my own death with my sister? No. I won't. You chose to live when I chose to die, and that's the end of it. Yeah, but I wasn't afraid to speak. I warned you that all of this would happen. No, 
you must live. I have been dead for a long time, walking through life, but without life. I am well suited to honor the dead and to die for it. These girls are neurotic lunatics, both of them. Well, are you surprised? Anyone would crack. Even the most tough-minded person under such treatment. You lost your senses when you allowed yourself to be influenced by her lunacy. There is no life for me without her. You're not without my own sister. You have no sister. She's as good as dead. Will you kill the girl your son wishes to marry? You insult your own. They are formally betrothed to marry. You bring an ax to your own family tree. My lord Creon, this policy of yours has worried me from the start. My political instinct tells me that this may be some sort of warning or sign, perhaps from the gods. You hold a treasure in your hands, Antigone. Life, I mean, and you want to throw it away. Marry Haman and do it quickly. Life is not what you think it is. Life is a child playing around your feet, a tool you hold firmly in your grip, a bench you sit down upon in the evening in your garden. People will tell you that that's not life, that life is something else, that they will tell you that because they need your strength and your fire and they will want to make use of you. Don't listen to them. Believe me when I tell you that the only poor consolation that we have in our old age is to discover what I have just told you is true. Life is perhaps, after all, nothing more than the happiness that you get out of it. Happiness. It's not much of a word, is it? What kind of happiness do you foresee for me? Paint me the picture of your happy antiquity. What are the unimportant little sins that I shall have to commit before I am allowed to sink my teeth into life and tear happiness from it? Tell me, to whom shall I have to lie? Upon whom shall I have to fawn? To whom must I sell myself? Whom do you want me to leave dying while I turn away my eyes? Antigone, be reasonable. Why do you ask me to be reasonable when all I want to know is what I have to do to be happy? You tell me that life is so wonderful. I want to know what I must do in order to be able to say that myself. Do you love Haman? Yes. I love Haman. <laughs> the Haman I love is hard and young and faithful and difficult to satisfy the way that I am. But if what I love in Haman is to be worn away like a stone step by the tread of the thing that you call life, the thing that you call happiness? If Haman reaches the point where he stops growing pale with fear when I grow pale, if he stops thinking that I have been killed in an accident when I am five minutes late, if he too has to learn to say yes to everything, why, no, then no, I do not love Haman. You do not know what you are talking about. I do know what I'm talking about. It is you who can't hear me. I'm too far away from you now, talking to you from a kingdom you can't get into. With your preaching and your politics and your persuasive logic, I laugh at your smugness, Creon, thinking you could prove me wrong or alter my purpose with your platitudes about happiness. It is your happiness too, Antigone. I spit on your idea of happiness. I spit on your idea of life. That life must go on, come what may. You are all like dogs that lick everything they smell. You, with your promise of a humdrum happiness, provided a person doesn't question justice in our corrupt society. If life must be a thing of fear and lying and compromise, if life cannot be free and incorruptible, then Creon, I choose death. Oh, scream on, daughter of Oedipus, in your father's own voice. Yes, in my father's own voice. We come of a tribe that asks questions, and we ask them remorselessly to the bitter end. We respect things bigger than ourselves. Look at yourself, Creon. That glint of fear and suspicion in, your, in the corner of your eyes, that crease in the corner of your power-loving mouth. Oh, you said the word yourself, the stench of politics. You stand for nothing but stench. If you could see how ugly you are screaming those words. I am ugly, ugly like my father. But my father became beautiful 
And you know when, at the very end, when all his questions had been answered. I've always wanted to be beautiful, Antigone. Antigone, I, I see it now. I'm the ugly one. I've always been so ugly. This madness ends now. Guards, take her away! Oh no, Creon! Take her to some lonely place, rocky and unfrequented by anyone. Find a cave and wall her up in it to bury her alive. But with just enough food so that no guilt for her death will fall either upon us or the state. See it done! Guard nods, salutes, and exits. Sir, is this the best choice of a king? She's betrothed to your son, a member of your very family. Death parts all lovers, sooner or later. Wise man considers all advice. No man on earth is strong enough to dissuade her. Polynices was a mere pretext. That's how the land lies. The poor child's doomed. Her death warrant sealed and delivered. Justice must be served. How can we talk of justice while we watch this? She's a young bride being led to her funeral. What do you want me to do for her? She broke the law. She, should I let her live and condemn the city to hypocrisy? Um, excuse me, sir. <clears throat> Your son is here. Father. Son. Lucky are those whose lives never taste evil. For once the gods attack a family, their curse must visit, must visit every child. Old hands of the dead reach out for the living. No one is spared. The characteristic sin of Oedipus, arrogance, brings its bleak harvest in. For Zeus is all-powerful. No man can match him, and those who climb in the greatness or wickedness beyond the permitted height he brings to destruction and despair. When a man commits crimes and is proud of his action, a flaming sword hangs over his head. No future but the grave and a funeral urn. Forget Antigone, Haman. Forget her. Creon indicates for Haman to sit very formally. A staff member brings over a cup of coffee to Haman. It is very practiced. These two men have done this before. Creon indicates for the office work to continue. He picks up a folder and idly looks through its contents while speaking with his son. I know I am your son. I understand the depth of your experience in matters of state and I would try to follow and benefit from it whenever I can. Any marriage would be worthless to me without your approval and love. I did everything I could to save her, Haman. I used every argument, I swear I did. The girl doesn't love you. Don't be taken in. Don't let any woman ensnare you by exploiting your attraction to her. Sex lures infatuated men into submission. Passion never lasts, my boy. She could have gone on living, but she refused. She wanted it this way. She wanted to die. Father, the gods instill reason in men. It's the most valuable thing that we possess. I don't have the skill, nor do I want it, to contradict you. Look, it's not in your nature to notice what people say and do and what they don't like. The harsh look on your face makes people afraid. No one tells you what you'd rather not hear, but I hear what people think. Listen, Thebes aches for this girl. No person ever, they are saying, less deserve to die. When her own brother died in that bloodbath, she kept him from lying out there unburied. Fair game for dogs and vultures. They whisper it, but many believe she deserves her name on the roll of honor. Shall Thebans dictate how I govern? There is nothing I prize more, father, than your welfare. What makes a son more proud than his father's thriving reputation? Don't fathers feel the same way about their sons? Attitudes are like clothes. 
You can change them. Don't think that what you say is always right. If I, as a younger man, can offer a thought, it's this. It would be better if men were born with perfect understanding, but things don't work that way. The best response to good advice is to learn from it. Let yourself change. Father, they are treating her like an animal. I can't stop them. It's too late. Antigone has spoken. I cannot save her now. You have to. I cannot. Recall your edict, Barry Polynices. Too late. The law must be obeyed. I can do nothing. But Father, you are the leader of Thebes. I am master under the law, not above the law. But you made that law yourself, and what you ordained, you can repeal. You would be careful to correct your father. When I know you are wrong, I have to speak. You are weak and contemptible with no will of your own. You are a woman's mouthpiece. I plead for you and for myself and for common humanity. Dignity for the dead. I cannot do anything else, my boy. She must die and you must live. Live? For what? A life without antiquity? A life in which I am to go on admiring you as you busy yourself with your kingdom? Go on admiring you as you make your persuasive speeches and strike your attitudes? Not without Antigone. She never waited for me to admire her. Mirrors meant nothing to her. She never looked at herself. She looked at me, expected me to be somebody. And I was when I was with her. Do you think I am not going to go after her? I will not live without Antigone. Haman, you will have to resign yourself to it. Sooner or later, there comes a day of sorrow in each man's life where he must cease to be a child and take up the burden of being a man. That day has come for you. That giant strength, that courage, that massive God who used to pick me up in his arms and shelter me from the shadows and monsters, was that you, Father? Was it of you I stood in awe? Was that man you? Yeah, Haman, that was me. Eurydice, wife of Creon, mother of Haman, enters. She stands watching, quietly, listening. You are not that man today. For if you were, you'd know that your enemies were abroad in every street. You'd know that the people revere those gods that you despise. Already the people curse you because you do not bury Polynices. If you kill Antigone, they will hate you. You cannot take her away from me. You will never marry that girl. She won't live long enough to see that day. If she dies, she won't die alone. Are you threatening me? How dare you threaten your Is father? Is anyone else allowed to speak? Must you have the last word in everything? I must and I will! And you, I promise you, will regret what you have spoken here today. I will not be sneered at or contradicted by anyone. Sons can be punished too. Bring her out, let her die, here and now, in the open, with her bridegroom beside her as a witness. You can watch the execution. That's one sight I will never see. Nor from this moment will you ever see me again. Haman rises and exits. Creon makes no notice of the boy leaving until after he has left. He gets up to follow Haman, but stops when he sees Eurydice, who turns and exits. Creon follows his wife. The gods have a way of punishing injustice. When the god of unbridled passion makes war, he always wins. No force can withstand his powerful, merciless hand. His traps are set, and no man's sins or virtues can keep him from the net. The mania is universal. The gods themselves run mad. Men lose their wits and no one is spared. The chorus exit as the guards enter with Antigone. They notice that the office is now, interestingly, empty. Nice. You ever notice that city offices are always empty when you need something? Those jockeys never work. Always at lunch. Hey, don't knock it. They get a pension just like you and me. It's you, is it? What do you mean? The last human faces I shall see. We don't make the rules. You hurt me this morning. There was no need for you to hurt me. Did I act as if I were trying to escape? Come on now, miss. It's our business to arrest you. How old are you? We shouldn't fraternize. 39. 
Have you any children? Yeah, two. Do you love your children? Of course he does. Stupid question. How long have you been in the guards? Oh, since the war. I was in the army, sergeant. Then I joined the guards. But when they make you a guard, you lose your stripes. I see. Of course, if you're a guard, everyone knows you're something special. They know you're an old non-com. Take pay, for instance. When you're a guard, you get your pay. And on top of that, you get six months extra pay to make sure you don't lose anything by not being a sergeant no more. I see. That's why sergeants, they don't like the gods. Maybe you notice they try to make it out that they're better than us. Promotion. That's what it is. In the army, anybody can get promoted. The army will promote a grunt for tying his boots correctly. Just for putting them on their right feet. All you need is good conduct. Now in the guards, it's slow. And you have to know your business, like how to file a report and the like of that. It's more than just filling out reports. You're damn right it is. And when you're a non-com in the guards, you've got something that even a sergeant major ain't got. For instance, you've got... Yes, miss. I'm going to die soon. For instance, people have a lot of respect for the guards they have. A guard might be a soldier, but he's kind of in the civil service too. Do you think it hurts to die? How would we know? Of course, if somebody sticks a saber in your guts and turns it around, it hurts. <laughs> How are they going to put me to death? Uh, I'll tell you. I heard the proclamation, all right. There isn't much that gets away from me. Seems they don't want to... Uh... Wait a minute. How did that go now? In order that our fair city shall not be polluted with a sinful blood, she shall be immured. That means they shove you in a cave and they wall up the cave. Alive? Yeah. Oh, tomb. Oh, bridal bed alone. Yup. Outside the southeast gate of town, in the cave of Hades, broad daylight. Some detail for them that's on the job, right? First they thought maybe it was a job for the army. But now it looks like it's gonna be the gods. There's an outfit for you. Nothing the gods can't do. No wonder the army's jealous. A pair of animals. What do you mean a pair of animals? When the winds blow cold, all they need to do is press close against one another. I am all alone. Say, is there anything you want? I can send out for it, you know. You are very kind. Yes, there is something I want. I, I want you to give someone a letter for me when I am dead. How's that again? A letter? Yes, I, I want to write a letter and I want you to give it to someone for me. I I'll give you this ring if you will do it. Uh, 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 no can do. Suppose they go through his pockets. You might get six months for a thing like that. Listen, I'll tell you what I'll do. You tell me what you want to say. And I'll write it down on my book. Then afterwards, I'll tear out the pages and give them to the party. See? It's in my handwriting. It's all right. In your handwriting? Oh, my poor darling. In your handwriting? All right. No skin off his nose. No, be quick about it. Time is getting short. Where is your notebook? Right. Now. My darling. <laughs> the boyfriend, huh? My darling. I had to die. And perhaps you will not love me anymore. Love me anymore. Perhaps you think it would have been simple to accept life. To accept life. But it was not for myself. And now it's all so dreadful here alone. I'm afraid. And, and those shadows. Hey, 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 take it easy. How fast do you think I can write? <sighs> Where are you? Dreadful here alone. I am afraid. Your handwriting is terrible. No. Scratch that out. Nobody must know that. They have no right to know. It's as if they saw me naked and touched me after I am dead. Scratch that out. Just write. Forgive me. I scratch out everything there at the end and put, forgive me. Yes. Forgive me, my darling. You would all have been so happy if it hadn't been for Antigone. I love you. No, it wasn't for myself. Okay, had it been for Antigone, I love you. Is, is that all? That's all. You know, that's a funny kind of letter. I know. Now, who's it to? I'm the move, fellas. But I haven't finished yet. Shut up. 
The three guards take Antigone out quickly. It's over for Antigone. And now it's Creon's turn. The chorus return to their desks and to work. Creon sips his coffee, looking over papers. Enter Tiresias, a custodian, emptying waste baskets and sweeping the floor. He is unnoticed by everyone. He reaches past Creon. Blind men must travel with someone's help. Excuse me? Sharing eyes with the helper is the way blind men make their journeys through this world. Do you know to whom you are speaking? Speak to a man in a floundering ship, his hands on the wheel, to the one man who said yes. He desperately needs help. Oh, he knows it not. Eresius, the prophet, you have news. Yes, important news that cannot wait. And advice which, if you are wise, you will listen to. I've always listened to your advice. All right, I'll tell you. But you must trust this prophet. I know your value. I learned it firsthand. And it has helped you keep thieves on a straight course? I admit it. We are all in your debt. All right, then, for God's sake, listen to me now. You're like a man balanced on a razor, likely to fall and cut himself to pieces. Are you serious? Any man would shudder hearing such things from your lips that have foretold so many horrors. Tell me what you mean. Well, everything my experience of forecasting the future and understanding symbols has revealed to me. I will make it plain to you, King Creon. You have decreed a filth that chokes the gods with your edict. Listen to me. Your prophecy, it's everywhere. Tell him. Sir, I have news from the streets. Her action is famous. Mouths everywhere whisper Antigone. She goes down to the dead with the promise of glory. Any good advice is worth more than a fortune to any man. Any man can make a mistake or commit a crime. A man who can recognize what he has done, see that he was mistaken or morally wrong, admit and put it right, proves that it is never too late to become wise. But if he compounds his mistake with stubbornness to face the facts, he is nothing but a fool. Is there anyone more stupid than the stupid man who cannot see his own stupidity? Listen, Polynices is dead. Don't revenge yourself on his remains. You can kill a man once, and once only. Do you realize the man you are talking to? I am the king. Yes, yes, you are the king. My advice, coming to you in different guises and different forms, helped to make you one. You've had your successes, I know that, but... You've been proven right on more than one occasion, but honesty is another matter. I've never trusted your voice. Do not provoke me to tell you anything. The dark waters of prophecy are better left undisturbed. Disturb them. I don't care. My decisions as king are made for one reason, for the stability and care of the state. Are there any wise men left? Anywhere? My goodness, how profound. You have made me angry. You usurp ancient rights, which even the gods themselves don't dare question. Powers which are not in the prerogative of kings. Listen, Creon, this is the truth. You have disgusted the gods. Other cities and states will turn upon you for the crime that you have committed. Dogs and vultures will swarm the streets dropping fragments of unburied men at corners on doorsteps in public squares. Before the sun has risen, you will have made your payment. Corpse for corpse with a child of your own blood. You bury the living and leave the dead uncovered. You have wronged them both. The suffering that you have inflicted upon others will be inflicted upon you, and you will suffer as they did. Theresius exits. Creon stands in the middle, surrounded, but alone. My mind is torn apart like a tug of war, one way and then the other. How can I give way now, but how can I stand here like a fool and wait stubbornly for whatever disaster might be coming? Lord Creon, 
It's time to take good advice. Give it then. Don't be afraid. I'll listen. Release the woman from her underground prison and give honorable burial to the dead man. Is that your advice? Total collapse. Complete withdrawal. Do, do you all think that? We do, sir. How can I do it? It's unendurable to deny every principle and every action I stood fast by. Go on, sir. Do it now. And do it personally with your own hands. Yes. Yes, I'll go myself at once. If I've changed my mind, I'll act upon it with exactly the same determination. I sentenced her, and I'll set her free. The, 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 tear down the bricks with my own hands if necessary. Perhaps it is wiser to let the old laws stand. My fear tells me that it is. No man's life ever moves smoothly, according to plan. Who can make judgments, say this is praiseworthy in human existence, and that is to be despised when chance rules everything? One moment a man rides high on his fortune, and the same moment he crashes down into the depths. Luck, like the tide, is certain to ebb and flow, and no man can tell what will happen tomorrow. Everyone surely envied Creon. He had saved his country from its enemies, taken power as king, and his position in the state was unchallenged. What's more, he ruled with a firm hand and his son at his side to help and succeed him. All that is over now. What life can there be when things that made life pleasant are all destroyed? A kind of death, moving and breathing, but not living. And that's how it is for him. Of course, he is rich beyond accounting. He's a king still. But what's it worth when all the joy of life is gone? The queen? The queen? Uh, where's the queen? Tell us your news. They're both dead. And the living must take the blame. Who killed them? Who's dead? What happened? News to break a mother's ha heart. Antigone had been thrust into the cave, and they hadn't finished heaving the last blocks of stone into place when Creon arrived. And we heard a sudden moaning from the tomb, and a hush fell over us all, for it was not the voice of Antigone. It, it was Haman's voice that came forth from the tomb. And everyone looked at Creon, and, and, and he howled like a, like a man demented. Take away the stones! Take away the stones! <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, good friend. My heart caught something of what you were saying a few words as I opened the door. I was on my way to offer prayers to Palace and Thien. We had just drawn open the door when I heard a few scrapes of your conversation. Enough to make me fear what all mothers fear, an accident or some disaster to those we love. I almost fainted. Please speak it out, plainly. Whatever it is, I can bear it. We are bred to stoicism in this family. You're just telling me. <clears throat> my, my queen, whom we all respect, I was there. I saw it all. I'll, I'll tell you what happened. The slaves leapt at the wall of stones, and Lord Creon worked with them, sweating and, and tearing at the blocks with bleeding hands. And finally, a narrow opening was forced, and, and light gave way to a horrible scene. Antigone had hanged herself by the cord of her robe, by the red and golden twisted cord of her robe, and the robe was around her neck like a child's collar. And Haman was on his knees, he was holding her in his arms and moaning, and his, his face buried in her robe. And more stones were removed, and, and Creon went into the tomb, and he, he tried to raise Haman to his feet. And I could hear him begging Haman to rise to his feet, but Haman was deaf to his father's voice, until suddenly he stood up of his own accord, and his, his eyes were dark and burning, and anguish was in his face, and he stared at his father. And, Suddenly, he, he struck him hard in the face, and then he pulled out a knife and he lunged at his father, and Creon leapt out of range, and Haman went staring at him in his eyes, full of contempt, a glance that Creon couldn't escape. 
And the king stood trembling at the far corner of the cave and Haman went on staring. And then without a word, he stabbed himself and, and lay down beside Antigone, embracing her in a great pool of blood. Eurydice turns and exits slowly. That's a strange reaction. She goes without a word, giving no indication of her feelings. A public demonstration of grief, it would be unlike her. She'll, she'll suffer like any other mother, but in private, uh, she seemed to feel nothing. I, in my experience, that can be dangerous. That sort of silence is sometimes more threatening than screaming in tears. I, I'll go after her, just to make sure that grief doesn't tempt her to do anything silly or, or except excessive. The messengers leave. The page enters, carrying a toy shovel and a briefcase. Creon enters behind him. I have had them laid out side by side. They are together at last and at peace. Two lovers on the morrow of their wedding. Their work is done. Not yours, Creon. You have still one thing to learn. I was responsible. There is no blame for him, none. My hope, my joy, my hand powered that knife. Uh, Eurydice, the, the queen, your wife. A good woman. When the queen was told of her son's death, she turned and left. She went up to a room and there, Creon, she cut her throat. She is laid out now exactly where you went to her one night when she was still a maiden. Her smile is still the same. One might think she is asleep. Me too. They are all asleep. <laughs> it must be good to sleep. Tomorrow, they will sleep sweetly in the earth, sir. And you will bury them. You who would not bury Polynices today will bury Eurydice and Haman tomorrow. And Antigone, too. The gods take a hand in every game, Creon, even in politics. The task is there to be done. They say it's dirty work. But if I didn't do it, who would? What time is it? Five o'clock, sir. What do we have on today at five o'clock? Cabinet meeting, sir. Cabinet meeting. We had better get along to it. And there we are. gathers a few things from his desk and slowly leaves the office, the page following after. All those who are meant to die have died. Those who believed one thing, those who believed the contrary thing, and even those who believed nothing at all were caught up in the web without knowing why. Creon was the most rational, the most persuasive of leaders. But like all tyrants, he refused to distinguish the things between the things that are of this world and the things that are of the gods. Now and again, in the 3,000 years since the first Antigone, other Antigones have arisen like a clarion call to remind men of this distinction. Their cause is always the same. A passionate belief that moral law exists and a passionate regard for the sanctity of human dignity. Well, Antigone is calm tonight. She has played her part. The three guards enter. They begin playing a game of cards. 
A great wave of unrest now settles down upon Thebes, upon the empty palace, and upon Creon, who can now begin to long for his own death. Only the guards are left, and none of this matters to them. They have their jobs to do. Walking. Okay. Walking the beat, making arrests. Keeping the peace. It's no skin off their noses. And on their break, they go on playing cards. Thank you so much for coming tonight. So glad to have you. Let's bring the actors out um, so you guys can meet these amazing performers. Um, I can just imagine that there's tons of clapping everywhere. Uh, let's give it up. Let's just kind of move around the room and let's first, let's look at these amazing chorus members. When I say your name, if you could just wave, that's Jeremy Lipton. Thank you so much. That's Alana Schimmel. Thank you so, so much for joining us. That's Sam Levigny. Well done, well done. That's Ollie McDonough, uh, magnificent. And that is Mariana Hoyt Lang, magnificent work tonight. So, so good. Let's give it up for the guards. Um, that's Morris Boratin. Thank you so much. Wave your hand to let us know who you are. That's uh, Henry Doring. Uh, well done, sir. And the incomparable Dean Nannis. Yeah, still playing <laughs> cards. He can't stop, won't stop. Uh, big, big love for the nurse. That is Cami Capello. The amazing, the wonderful. Um, and Eurydice, played by Grace Martino. Thank you so much. Magnificent work. Um, and giving it up now for the fantastic Teresius, played by Chris Espinoza. Thank you so, so much, sir. Uh, Ismini, played by Lena Kutcher. Thank you so, so much. Um, and we've got Creon, played by Kevin McCann, whose computer crashed in the middle of this performance <laughs> and he swooped back in like a stud. Um, yeah. uh, terrific. And that's Michaela McDonough playing our title role of Antigone. Um, and let's give some love to our audio engineer. If he'll show our, his face, that'd be great. His name is Will Laterer and he held it down for us. Thank you everyone so, so much for showing up. We, we got to give some love to, to Kleba for making this whole thing happen. Yeah. 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 Love to Kleba. Thank Thanks, you, bro. Please. Love Always all cool. you guys. Always love inspiring. all you guys. <laughs> hey, I'm on! Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. Um, I was thinking that if we want to, we could stick around for a Q&A. I don't know if people are interested in that. If you are um, <laughs> actors, I hope you don't mind me throwing that at you for a minute. If you need to dip, that's cool. 
but there's a lot of people still sticking around. I will tell you that um, at our height, we had over 80 people here. We still have more than 50, which is just incredible. Um, it's magnificent. You guys, I think we actually made some sort of history tonight. So I just want to say that um, this live performance to a live audience. Curtain call for Heyman. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm setting up a QA and a and um, for our attendees, if you'd like to. Um, hey, Cleve, Heyman needs a curtain question. call. Say again. Oh, I didn't give it to Heyman. Oh my God, I'm such a jerk. Matt Greco, the amazing Matt Greco, coming up from upstate Ooh. New York. I'm so sorry, Matthew. Jeez, Louise. No worries. This is what happens when you wing it. Uh, can I just tell you, you are amazing too. I'm really, really sorry. Completely unforgettable. That's on me, not you. I'm really sorry. Well, we we got a Q and A. Everybody set up. If you'd like to join us, uh, those of you at home, the more than 50 people who are still at home, we've got our first question, and it's coming at us. Um, from Dr. Ryan O'Hara, who is in the house, um, a magnificent teacher um, and an administrator at uh, Oyster Bay, um, if you can believe that. Uh, and his question is, where have you been on my pandemic? Uh, um, and I'm seeing that we're getting some responses here from Creon. Why don't we go around the corner? Why don't we just go around and why doesn't everybody say where you're coming from? So, um, you know, if we could, I don't know how well we can do this cleanly, but because uh, we're all in different parts of everybody's screens. Um, so chorus members, where are you guys from? Why don't you go from one, two, three, four? That's where are you coming at us from? Uh, so I'm, I'm actually, I was in New York City, but right now I'm in Jersey. Um, I'm actually at uh, chorus number three's place. Hi, Alana. Hi. Uh, we're in different rooms. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So yeah, that's, that's what's going on. Cool. All right, where else? Two? Um, I'm Mariana and I'm coming straight from Seacliff, Long Island, only a few blocks from that wee old high school. Keep going. Uh, hi, I'm Alana. I'm from New Jersey. Cool. Course four. Uh, hi, I'm Ollivander. Uh, I'm also in the same house as Antigone. I don't know where she is on the screen. Oh my God. Um, and we are also on Long Island. Beautiful. I was oops, it's me. I was in Manhattan. I uh, got picked up by my lovely father and sent to Connecticut for safekeeping. <laughs> How about it? Connecticut in the house, Jersey in the house, uh, Long Island in the house. All right, guards, where are we at? Guards one, two, three. Just run it down. Guard one, where are you coming at it from? Maine. 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 <laughs> Maine. Three, two. Coming at you from Forest Hills, Queens. Woo, Queens. Oh. What up? And I mean, where else are the gods going to be from? New York. <laughs> bada bing, bada boom. You know what I'm saying? How you doing? How you been? Uh, all right. Hey, hey, Heyman, where are you at? Where are you coming from? Uh, I'm coming from Ithaca, New York. How about it? Far, far away. Far away, but clear as a bell. And, uh, and, and how about you, uh, nurse? Where are you at? Right now, I'm in Astoria, Queens. Another Queens person. I love it. I love it. Right. And and Tiggany, we found out that you're you're on Long Island as well. And uh, Ismini, where are you coming at us from? Uh, Long Island, and with my parents. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. And uh, and and uh, Eurydice, I think you might be our furthest away. Yeah, coming at us from Los Angeles. Woo! Isn't that fun? California in the house. Uh, Teresius, where are you coming from? Coming at you from beautiful Rosin Harbor, Long Island, New York. Always beautiful, <laughs> Rosin Harbor. Uh, and Creon, where are you at? I'm in North Philly. Yeah, baby. Freaking representing. <laughs> Thanks for keeping that flag up. You know that that warms uh, my heart. And uh, audio engineer, Will, where are you coming from? I'm from uh, Western Connecticut. Another Connecticut kid. Did I miss Connect anybody? Connecticut, baby. Did I miss anybody? <laughs> Great. All right, beautiful. Um, okay, got a question coming at us from Alec Nation, the one and only amazing Alec Nation. His question is to the nurse, um, <laughs> where did you draw inspiration um, from to pull the character of a seasoned woman who almost single-handedly raised several children? All right, Alec. Um, <laughs> I mean, Honestly, Ron Weasley's mom is where I sort of went to. <laughs> I hate you, Alec. Okay. 
That's it. I, that, that was a that was a really beautiful Q and A right there. Um, and uh, we got a, we got a question here from Brian Messmer, Mr. Messmer himself, the 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 musical genius, the uh, the velvet voice himself. Um, wouldn't be here without him. Just want to add that I wouldn't be here without him. How about that? We're how about that? Um, he's, he's, he just says, I don't have a question. I just want to thank you all caps for this. I remember your OG performance five years ago. I'm so happy to see you all. <laughs> this was wonderful. And then do this, my friends. That's Love you, Mass. Real recognized real, baby. Um, we, got, we got an anonymous attendee asking a question that I think is probably kind of broad, but I, I, I guess I'd like to kind of direct this one to those of you who are pursuing professional art making. So I know that everybody here is an artist. And let me just speak for a second as somebody who directed these guys, everybody but Alana, who, by the way, dude, you were sick. Can I just say it? I mean, just on behalf of everyone, what a marvelous performance. So she came in cold. We had no rehearsals Yay. with her. Uh, you're a, you're a pro, dude. You're oh, a pro. Stop. <laughs> um, no, for real. You, you, you're, you're great. Take it. Just say thank you because it's true. Thank you. Thank um, you're you. welcome. Appreciate you're it. welcome. Um, so this is a question for, for all y'all uh, to think about, but I want to I want to want to put this towards those of you who are pursuing uh, professional art making. Maybe we'll make this one the um, yeah we'll make this one the last question. Um, you know what what are your what are your artistic uh, like what's keeping you going as an artist, especially in a world like the crisis that we're in right now? What's keeping you going as somebody who's like crazy enough slash brave enough? uh to to be making art and i don't know who wants to take this so i'll i'll put this out there but i know there's a handful of you who are who are professional i mean you're doing it right i mean raise your hand first of all if you are pursuing a a career in arts right now so take a look at that for a second that's from north shore schools everybody um by the way our art <laughs> program happens uh almost entirely on the fringes that's not a knock but it is what it is so let's let's hear from a couple of you um, and try to, if you can, keep it short. Uh, we're down to 38 attendees and we're gonna keep drifting off. And I know you guys are tired too, because you just did a lot of work. So um, so uh, Mick, you wanna jump in there? I saw your hand go up first. And if you could keep it tight so that the people at home can get something from it. Yeah, sure. Um, so hi, I'm uh, Michaela. I go by Mick.music if you want to uh, follow me on Instagram. Um, I went to Berkeley College of Music. That's my thing that's the thing that i that really really drives me and you know i uh was really really kind of shocked to find myself in this position as we all have been um you know like many people i lost my job um and that i suddenly feel like i was given this space and this gift of time that i may never get the opportunity to do something like this again. And so really, I mean, you know, I've been sitting down here in my studio, writing it, writing and, you know, and composing and doing all of this stuff. And like, it's really, it's the thing that's kept me going and it's given me purpose in a time where sometimes things feel purposeless. Um, and then of course there's this, so. Beautiful, thank you. I'm, uh, by the way, I'm just kind of texting students, some of my students, again, to the audience at home who's still around. We did this for the, my 10th grade honors English students. I mean, those of you who came who aren't a member of the, those classes, we were glad to have you, but this was, this was delivered with love for, for kids who are right now, like basically having their spring semester completely taken from them. Um, a, a, a 10th grade uh, spring semester, they'll never get back again. So um, anyway, I was just texting a few of them back. They loved it, you guys. I'm getting tons of texts from them, which is a really big deal. Like they loved it. Um, it's really, really cool. So I saw a few other hands. Uh, I'd love to just hear from a few of the people. Uh, Jeremy, why don't you get in there? What do you got for us? Yeah, uh, as an actor, um, it's important to draw inspiration from your real life and your real life experiences and the people you connect with every day. And for me, what's been keeping me going and inspired through this is I've been taking writing classes. I've been um, doing, I've been reading books. I've been doing other Zoom readings, such as this. Um, and it's, it's reminding us the roots. And I think of the first rehearsal we talked about why we're here. And it's because in a time like this, with this crisis going on, we don't have a lot of opportunity to reach out. And so what we go to is books, music, TV, you know, it's the arts that we're drawn to naturally uh, in our raw state. And I think that's what's keeping me going. 
Beautiful. Thank you for that. Let's get a couple more people who are studying to be artists who want to talk. Maybe you don't want to. It's okay. Sam, are you raising your hand? Yeah, I was. <laughs> um, yeah, graduated musical theater from Northwestern um, with a concentration in TV film. Um, so I would say the biggest thing I've learned right now is to stop fearing failure because what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, like create your own safe haven, create your own time and like make this yours. Try hobbies that scared you and that you might fail at. I was always really scared to play instruments. I've started to try and teach myself piano again. Um, encourage your friends to make stuff. If, you, if you're like, oh, this person's really great at this and I'm not, like let them have a hand. I texted one of my music director friends and now he's doing this huge cabaret we're putting together and I'm getting to sing for Glinda and Wicked again and I'm stoked and I don't know how to music direct, but he does. So like reach out to your friends. Everyone wants to hear from you. Everyone wants to make art be fearless and send love and just like make beautiful things and don't care if it like kind of sucks. What a Please. great way to end. Actually, that's a great way to end. Um, you know, the, the, here's the thing. Fearlessness isn't real. And, and maybe this is a good place to end with, right? Uh, bravery isn't required if you're not afraid. Um, courage demands like, that those butterflies in your gut, that sense that you're not strong enough to do what you're trying to do, that's, that is what courage is. That this whole thing about like no fear, it's not real. No fear means no feeling. And no feeling is probably one of the most dangerous things you can, you can try to have, right, is no feeling. So um, Antigone is an amazing play and it's, it, she's an amazing character because she's terrified, right? She says, I'm a coward too, she says to Ismond. You know, I, so what that you're a coward? Me too, I'm terrified, but we gotta do this, is what she says. I have to do this. And so whoever you are out there, whatever you're doing, art is not a sideline thing. It is the stuff of life. It is the thing that gets us up out of bed. And as we look around our world right now and we wonder what's happening, this is historic, you guys. We're in the middle of this event, global event, it's, it's probably one of the biggest events in the history of humans. It's just hard to really get our heads around that. I guess I just want to invite all of you to be the artist that you are and trust yourselves and take risks. You're going to screw up. You're going to suck. You're going to make mistakes. As Sam was saying, like, it, it is. It's going to be bad sometimes. It's going to be terrible sometimes. And what you do is you get up and then you try again and you try again. People are going to tell you no. They're going to tell you you're bad. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to say you look bad. They, you're going to say they sound bad. They're going to tell you these things. And you can't let it stop you. You can't. You can't. You got to feed from it. You got to learn from it. And you got to grow. Um, just uh, want to send a lot of love. Let's get those hands up, actors. Let's send the love out to all those people out there who watched us tonight. Thank you so much. Yeah, jazz hands, spirit fingers. You know what to do. Um, uh, Cass, I'm going to ask you guys if you want to. I'm going to set up another Zoom so we can do a little after breakdown if you want. If you don't want to, then we'll say goodbye to the world. Thank you so much for coming. We love you. Why don't you guys unmute and send the love out, say goodbye. And we will talk to you again sometime soon, I hope. Love to Bye. all of you. Bye. 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 Love, love, love. Bye. 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 Bye.